coming up tonight on the News at 6. Out-of-state money is helping fund the effort to legalize marijuana in Montana. We'll tell you where it's coming from. Plus, is your mailbox flooded with Election Day mailers? You are not alone. From Montana's news leader, this is MTN News at 6. Well, good evening and welcome to the News at 6. I'm Marian Davidson. Thanks for joining us. Well, a windy day out there today. Let's get right into first weather with Chief Meteorologist Curtis Gravenitz. Well, the wind has certainly affected everybody and caused some problems around the state, including fanning some flames, a little wildfire around to the Helena, East Helena area here, but also the wind tipped over a semi here right near Conrad and uh, the Ponderay County Disaster Emergency Services closing down the interstate uh, through Conrad here for 24 hours. This was uh, a few hours ago that they initiated this closure. Emergency vehicles only though until tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening. Tough travel really all around the state, but especially those roads that go north south because this wind is coming in uh, from the west. But uh, we've got all sorts of uh, high wind warnings and watches here throughout to most of the states and tomorrow could even be windier than what we saw out there today. Literally gone with the wind. Uh, maybe your garbage can that is. Uh, wetter is better. At least we're getting some wet weather and even some snow on some of the state's wildfires. And uh, we've got a storm that will include some snow and some much colder temperatures. I'll let you know when coming up in the forecast. Thanks for that, Curtis. And our top story this evening, the campaign to support marijuana legalization in Montana has gotten much of its funding from one out of state organization. Now that group is facing complaints that it has not been transparent enough about where its money comes from. MTN's Jonathan Ambarian reports. The North Fund, headquartered in Washington, D.C., has contributed roughly $4.8 million to support two ballot measures that would create a recreational marijuana system in Montana. And so far, it hasn't released any information about who donated that money. The North Fund filed with the Commissioner of Political Practices as an incidental committee, a group that doesn't have to release information on its donors because its primary purpose is something other than spending in elections. Commissioner Jeff Mangan sought to reclassify it as an independent committee, which would have to reveal its donors. But the North Fund asked last month for that decision to be reconsidered. Last week, Steve Zabawa of the group Wrong for Montana, which is opposing the marijuana legalization effort, filed a complaint against the North Fund, saying campaign activities were central to its existence and it should be required to reveal its donors. Nobody knows who the wizard is. You know, we, all we want to do is look push the, car, the curtain over and find out who the Wizard of Oz is, in this case, the Wizard of Pot. Zabawa's complaint points to reports that the North Fund has spent millions in campaigns on other issues in other states, including Missouri, Colorado, and Ohio. We asked the North Fund to respond to the complaint. In a statement, a spokesperson said this, our response to the initial COPP letter defines North Fund's mission to carry out public education and advocacy efforts regarding progressive policies through grassroots organizing, legislative lobbying, or ballot measures on a wide range of issues. It clearly states that North Fund was not established to focus solely on any specific state or policy proposal, including cannabis policy reform or marijuana legalization. Commissioner Jeff Mangan declined to comment on any active complaint. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. New Approach Montana has raised a total of nearly $7 million to support its legalization measures. Initiative I-190 would set up the framework for a recreational marijuana system. Constitutional Initiative 1-118, or 1-18, sorry, would amend the state constitution to let the state prohibit marijuana sales to people younger than 21. A record amount of money has already been spent on the 2020 elections in Montana, flooding the airwaves, internet, and mailboxes with political advertising. MTN's John Riley has a look at how the mailers stack up. seems like a lot, but that's probably to be expected when the third most expensive Senate race in the nation is happening in the state with the sixth smallest population. For the last month, I've been collecting mailers from a handful of households in the Hilna area, representing every age range and political leaning. 
Of the 98 mailers collected, 45 were from third-party groups like PACs, 36 were from political parties, and 16 were from candidate campaigns. It's um, certainly uh, a lot this year, uh, and I think anybody who's been seeing ads or getting mailers uh, can, can attest to that, particularly for our U.S. Senate race. Of the mailers I collected, two-thirds were for the Senate race. 30 were from outside organizations, 28 were from political parties, and only two were from the candidates themselves. The National Institute on Money and Politics reports $68 million has been spent in Montana as of October 7th from groups not directly affiliated with a campaign, an expensive gamble from both sides. However, mailers and other political advertising on the Montana Senate race are only symptoms of a larger fight at hand, with the Republic Senate Leadership Fund and the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee matching blow for blow. And this is really... Uh in the context of, of a larger battle that's happening for the U.S. Senate. And it's seen as very much up for grabs right now between the Republicans and the Democrats, and we're seeing record numbers all over the country. The mailers I collected are only a small selection from Helena, and different groups will be focusing on different areas of the state. But given what's potentially at stake, don't expect political advertising to relent anytime before November 3rd. Reporting in Helena, John Riley, MTN News. And if you're looking for more information on candidates, issues, and voter resources, visit ktvh.com slash MTN elections. There you can find links to eight different debates with candidates for federal and statewide offices, important dates to remember leading up to the election, and MTN coverage on ballot issues and political spending. That address again is ktvh.com slash MTN elections. Montana added more than 420 cases of COVID-19 over just the past 24 hours. Active cases are now well over 6,700. Coronavirus-related deaths in the state are just shy of 220, but more than 12,000 people have recovered from the virus. And still ahead on the News at 6, a more than 100-year-old Augusta landmark is destroyed in a fire. What's ahead for the Bunkhouse Inn? News leader. You're watching MTN News at 6. Welcome back to the News at 6. Well, this weekend, the Bunkhouse Inn, a historic building in Augusta, burned to the ground. The volunteer fire chief was alerted to the fire around 1.30 Saturday afternoon. The Bunkhouse Inn was built in 1912 and was a historic landmark in Augusta. Firefighters worked tirelessly to put out the flames, but by 9 p.m., the building was lost. The Bunkhouse Inn owner said it was sad to see the historic building destroyed. This is such a landmark for this community, and it's for us, that's kind of what this was all about. And so, you know, that when we when we saw the damage happening, that was that was my first thought: is you know, we're just erasing history. It's just that was the sad part, you know. Local businesses offered food and water to the firefighters, while community members were offering their own guest bedrooms for those who were staying in the Bunkhouse Inn. The Augusta Chamber of Commerce expects to have fundraising events to help support the rebuild of the inn. All right, now let's check in with Chief Meteorologist Curtis Grevenitz for what's coming up in weather. Yeah, we had a lot of wind out there today, but who else saw some of the rainbows that were out there? Sometimes that happens when you have sun and clouds and showers and wind. Great picture from Chad's mom. More on the forecast coming up next, plus weatherwise. Now with Chief Meteorologist Curtis Grevenitz. Welcome back. Winter is right around the corner. The last several winters in Montana have ranged from one of the coldest and snowiest ever two years ago to an official dud last winter. In this week's Weatherwise, break out your boots, parkas, shovels, snow machines, and boards because most indications are of a tough winter ahead. Winter. It comes every year, sometimes five or more times here in Montana. Three out of the last five winters have been cold and snowy, and certain indicators point to another real Montana winter. The first indicator that you may be familiar with is La Nina conditions. In 70% of La Nina winters, the northern branch of the jet stream is energized and delivers colder temperatures and more snow to the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies. If you're a gambling man, approximately 30% of La Nina winters do not create harsh winter conditions. However, there are other global and solar influences that likely support the 70%. 
The Pacific Decadal Oscillation can be described as a long-lived El Nino-La Nina pattern of Pacific Ocean climate variability over the course of 10 to 30 years. This oscillation has been in a negative phase recently, and when this oscillation lines up with La Nina, those impacts may be magnified. So the recent trend would enhance La Nina. And perhaps you've heard me recently mention the solar activity and the solar cycle, which continues to be one of the least active cycles in about a century, baffling and impressing the scientific community. There have been links drawn to minimum solar cycles and what's called blocking in the polar regions. This blocking inhibits the west to east flow, forcing more jet stream undulations, increasing the likelihood of dislodging Arctic air near their poles and sending it towards the equator. More indicators are pointing toward a cold, snowy winter than not. Of course, predicting the weather for the upcoming winter season, let alone the next day, is challenging. So bundle up, winter is coming one way or another. And now you're a little more weather-wise. And winter showing up in the mountains here over this weekend into the start of this week. Check out East Glacier. Yeah, they don't call it Glacier for nothing. Uh, there was some snow flying. In Helena, still some really strong wind gusts in the last few hours. We've had some gusts up over 50 miles per hour, 55 degrees. The current temperature below average after our stretch last week of above average temperatures and near record highs. Great Falls, what a pretty color it is, and uh, the wind should begin to settle down in Great Falls here soon. It is already uh, settling down for a lot of uh, the high line here as a little more uh, stable air is moving in, but uh, temperatures 40s, 50s, couple of 60s out there again much cooler weather uh, since about Saturday when that front went through and here are the current sustained winds all right still pretty windy in Cup Bank and Great Falls but a little lighter wind up across the northern tier of the state and that trend will continue the wind easing up ever so slightly here through the overnight hours into tomorrow morning but the break will be brief because even stronger wind is likely through tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening here for a lot of the state. Power outages possible, maybe some damage to trees and some buildings as well as there could be some gusts between 60 and 80 miles per hour. Today we're generally between 50 and 70, but look at this all the way through tomorrow night into Wednesday morning. Extremely windy conditions before the wind begins to ease up later on Wednesday. We've had our fair share of uh, rain showers and mountain snow. I plotted some of the fire still on here. Uh, the Yogo fire that grew by about 300 400 acres on Saturday before some rain and snow helped out uh, with firefighting efforts uh, yesterday and then also today. Some snow up on the Bob and the Rocky Mountain front here. Some rain showers, maybe even a rumble of thunder crossing the high line. Some very nice rainfall on the Marias and uh, the Missouri as well and some rain showers into northeast Montana. So at least somebody's getting some uh, wet weather out there and most of the stormy weather here in the country will continue to be in the northern Rockies and the Pacific Northwest here over the next few days. So still a few isolated showers, maybe a rumble of thunder, a few flakes of snow in the mountains this evening. Overnight, the wind eases up somewhat here, but the next storm right on our heels, uh, that one will come in tomorrow morning, driving up over Rogers Pass, McDonald Pass, likely a little wet snow tomorrow morning. The snow levels will be rising through the morning hours, mainly looking at just rain, but how about some heavy rain, maybe even a few rumbles of thunder coming through tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening, and then the snow levels start to lower here. More snow by the time we get into Wednesday. I don't think it'll accumulate much in the lower elevations, but look at that from Lewistown, Haver, Big Sandy, Great Falls, looking at some snowflakes coming through here on Wednesday. So thus the temperatures will be a lot colder. Mountain snow. We see those darker shades of purple. We could be talking more than a foot in the Bob and up around Glacier National Park. Maybe a little coating up to an inch in the lower elevations. Tonight, the wind slowly dying down here over the next few hours, but still some locations holding on to the wind into the overnight hours. And here's the forecast for tomorrow. Another storm system moving in with even stronger wind. Temperatures in the 50s to about 60 tomorrow. And again, in the morning hours, some snow down to Mountain Pass level, but that snow will be 
rising, the snow level that is, through the day. Wednesday, some snow showers in the lower elevations here and a couple inches accumulating into the higher terrain. Still on the windy side, especially early on on Wednesday. Thursday, maybe a lingering mixed rain or snow shower in the lower elevations. A cool day, Lewistown only 43 for the high on Thursday. And then into Friday, the warm before the next storm. Temperatures in the 50s and the 60s, but a sharp cold front will come through here on Saturday, which will lower snow levels down to the valley floors and the plains. Maybe a light accumulation of wet snow in the lower elevations, like around Helena and for Great Falls. Very strong wind tomorrow into Wednesday, a little nicer for Thursday into Friday, and watching maybe the coldest temperatures of the year so far, moving in with snow on Saturday. Coming up, how law enforcement officers from around the U.S. are recognizing and honoring a Montana trooper injured in the line of duty. News Leader, you're watching MTN News at 6. Welcome back to the News at 6. A couple in Charlo wanted to show their support for Trooper Wade Palmer's recovery in a unique way. And as MTN's Connor McCauley reports, it took the entire country to put this project together. It's been over a year since Trooper Wade Palmer was shot multiple times while in his patrol vehicle here at Evero Hill. More than a year later, Palmer is still on his road to recovery while going through his rehab process. One Charlo couple thought it would be a good gesture to show that he's still in the hearts and on the minds of people here in Montana and across the country. I think it would lift his spirits, really. You know, when he goes through the stuff, he can think that these people cared enough to do the quilt and the, all the patches that they gave. I think so. It's, it's, they're, they're all one. You know, all the police, fire, all that, they're all one. Ellen and her husband Brian said they felt compelled to show their support for Trooper Palmer when they heard about the shooting in March of 2019. Since then, they have been collecting patches from first responders across the country. Ellen decided to put the patches onto a quilt that Palmer could keep with him forever. Along with the patches came something unexpected, notes and letters with messages of support and encouragement for a fallen brother. Reading the letters to me was a bit emotional, especially the card. On Monday morning, Trooper Michael Berman and Alexander Hyaday were on hand to receive the quilt and the letters that the Remingtons had gathered. Both troopers said the gesture was inspirational and they loved to see the support from the community. I thought it was awesome that people are still thinking of Wade. We think of him every day. Um, it was a big event, but it's a long recovery for him and it's a long recovery for the people of Montana too. Yeah, I think he's gonna be very appreciative and it'll just be heartwarming for him to know people still think about him. Trooper Berman and Hyde say that they'll probably take the quilt down to Trooper Palmer sometime this week. They say it'll be a great excuse to spend the day catching up with him. In Missoula, Connor McCauley, MTN News. All right, and we'll wrap things up here on the News at 6 when we come back. Tana's News Leader. You're watching MTN News at 6. Well, here's a sweet story for your evening. A young girl is on a mission to help animal shelters across the country, including one right in Montana in Great Falls. Since March, 13-year-old Avery Sontheimer has used a GoFundMe account to raise money to buy gift cards for shelters. She just sent a gift card to the McLean Cameron Animal Do Adoption Center, and so far, she sent gift cards to more than 900 shelters. She also includes a letter explaining who she is and what she's doing. Her dream is to become a vet tech or own her own animal shelter when she grows up. And you can find that link to the GoFundMe page on our website. And that does it for the News at 6. We'll be back here with your latest headlines and an update on the weather tonight at 10. We'll see you then.